Okay, I turned on the recording. Looks like we have a pretty strong kind of Midwest, Mid-Atlantic presence, and it's 12 o'clock, so let's click over to the presentation mode. And the, as the presentation loads, it's, uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce, well, let me introduce myself. I'm Peter Smallage. I, many of you, I recognize your names. I'm glad that you're back. Hope you're having a good summer. Um, I'm the New York State Extension Forester, and I'm the host of the Forest Connect webinar series. Uh, the other name you see up there is Christy Sullivan. Some of you will recognize Christy from some of the webinars she's doing or has done, and those she'll do in the future. She's agreed to help because I'm traveling, and if my internet goes out as we get started in particular, she's, she's here to help make sure things uh, launch smoothly. And our speaker, the person has the hard job and the hard task for today is Dave Apsley. Dave is a natural resources specialist with Ohio State University Cooperative Extension. I've known Dave since the, the early 1980s when Dave were, and I were forestry students together at Purdue University. Dave was the, my undergraduate TA for dendrology. So Dave, Dave taught me my trees. And we both ended up in the extension system and and uh, Dave offered to give a presentation on woodland wildlife food, particularly how to enhance mass production for woodland wildlife. So, Dave, thank you for joining us. And I'm going to, I'll turn, I'll mute my microphone and, and the floor is yours. So welcome and thanks for agreeing to present. Thank you, Pete. Um, I appreciate the offer to uh, present the webinar. It's my first, so please be patient with me. Uh, just a little background for me. Um, as Pete mentioned, I went to Purdue University. I also got my master's from the University of Georgia and had a variety of different work experiences, but currently I work for Ohio State University Extension and I mainly do landowner outreach, uh, focusing on private woodland owners. I do a little bit of uh, writing for publications and then I do some applied research. So that's a little background for me. Um, I'd like to know from the audience just who the audience is. How many of you are woodland owners versus, say, foresters or professional loggers? Or if you'd just give me some feedback, that would help me as well. That also helps me to know that somebody's out there. So, um, Looks like a good mix of folks from loggers to foresters to woodland owners, all of the above. So that's, that's interesting. Thanks for the, the input. Um, first thing I'd like to talk about is just why folks own uh, woodlands. So if I can get my mouse working here. Um, I apologize, this graph is a little busy. If you'd like to go to full screen mode, you can see the details a little bit better. That scared me a little bit. It went away for a while. Um, but what I'd like to do is just review a little bit. This data is from the uh, National Woodland Owner Survey work uh, that Brett Butler's involved with. And this morning, I just wanted to check. And, and essentially, I looked at 21 counties. It's uh, essentially region uh, 9 of the Forest Service or the eastern region. And I wanted to just get a little idea of what woodland owners and why woodland owners uh, manage woodlands. Just to give you a little information, uh, as far as wildlife, if you look at the first two bars, I think those relate at least indirectly or directly to wildlife and why folks own woodlands. The, the red bar on the extreme left and then the blue bar that's uh, next to it. And then if you go over the bars that are three and four from the right, there's a green bar, which I'm going to grab that mouse from Pete here and maybe get it to work. The green bar and then there's a kind of a gold bar, but it does show gives you an idea in relationship to forest ownership. Uh, many more folks are interested in wildlife than are, say, interested in uh, timber production. If you look at uh, this blue bar or, gold, or purplish bar here, timber production is much lower. So just to give you a reason why we're talking about a wildlife and food production, that gives a little background. So, first question is, what, what is wildlife habitat? What are the four components? Anybody want to provide some input on that? Uh, some of the old definitions actually listed three components. 
but some of the newer ones actually mention four. And uh, obviously, food is a major part of wildlife habitat. Water, cover, and finally, one that on some of the older definitions that's not mentioned is space. And that, that's space to, to be able to set up territories and, and so on. So that's, that's really important as well. But the focus of today is going to be uh, on the food aspect. Um, what I'd like to talk a li little bit about is what types of food does the forest produce for wildlife. And most folks think of what we're going to talk about today, and that is wildlife food or mast that comes from fruit. But are there other types of uh, food that the forest produces that folks can think of? Um, one that comes to mind is browse. If you're, if you're thinking deer or herbivores, there's browse. Um, and then there's also different sources, uh, carnivores and so on, the, the meat that is produced. But today we're going to focus mostly on mast. So I want to start out with a definition of mast. For some folks, um, this may be a new term, but essentially, uh, if you look at the definition from Webster, it says nuts accumulate on the forest floor, often serving as food for animals. Historically, they even talked about mast as a way to uh, provide food for livestock. And in the mountain country, uh, a lot of uh, early settlers depended on mast to fatten hogs and so on. Well, we're going to focus on a little bit different definition, and we're, we're going to use the fruit and seeds of trees and shrubs that are eaten by wildlife. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about mast. Essentially, every tree, every woody plant out there produces some kind of fruit or seeds, and there are very few that I can think of, I actually can't think of any, that aren't consumed by wildlife in some fashion. may not be the most preferred, but they are consumed by wildlife. There are really two types of mass. When we talk about mass, we tend to categorize them into two broad categories. The first one is hard mast. Hard mast are hard fruits or seeds, things like acorns, nuts, and so on. These things are really important because they have a long shelf life. They're available in the winter months. Uh, they're usually become available in the fall, and they last sometimes well into the winter months and even into spring. They're also nutritious, and they're important because they have high fat content. And for our native wildlife species that spend the whole year here, the year-round residents, hard mast is really critical because in the winter months, when you get into January, February, um, when food is really limiting, this hard mast is what sustains some wildlife populations. And it can play a big role in populations. Um, if you look at hard mast production, and squirrel populations, for instance, they're closely tied. And when we have poor hard mast years, squirrel populations plummet. There's also soft mast. And soft mast are the fleshy fruits, things like berries, droops, poems. Poems are actually ap like apples, or apples are poems. They tend to have a short life, short shelf life. They're somewhat perishable, and typically they're not available during the winter. There are exceptions during heavy years. For instance, grapes, uh, if they hang on the vines, uh, they can actually dry and become raisins and be available for later in the year. Their nutrition, uh, they're high in sugar and carbohydrates. Uh, these soft mast uh, species can be really important when it comes to migrating songbirds and so on so that they get those energy reserves to be able to, to make the long journey south. Um, there's a fact sheet that we put together in, uh, at OSU Extension, Ohio State University Extension. There's a web link down at the bottom of this fact sheet, and then also Pete made it available, and so it's a shared file that you'll be able to get to, and he just, I just noticed it popped up in the chat box. Um, it's called Enhancing Mast or Food Production for Woodland Wildlife. And one of the things we do in this fact sheet is we have tables that include species of trees and shrubs, the type of fruit they produce, and what types of wildlife use those, uh, those fruits. So that's, that's a resource that's available to you. 
And we focus on three things essentially in that fact sheet. The first is uh, planting trees and shrubs to enhance masts. And we're not going to focus on a lot, but we will mention it and talk about it a little bit later in the program. Mowing or cutting, things that you can do to uh, stimulate those brambles and, young, and, and shrubs and rotations that you can get on so that you'll have a constant supply of things like blackberries, raspberries, uh, blueberries, and so on. And then finally, and one of our large focuses today, is going to be on crop tree release. And I noticed Heather made the comment that soft mast is higher in, the, in fat in the fall, and that is true. And we're going to actually give you some examples of that later in the, in the talk. So crop tree release is going to be somewhat of a focus of our presentation. And for those of you that are new to it, I am assuming most of you have uh, been exposed to crop tree release. But Arlen Perkey, Brenda Wilkins, and Clay Smith kind of developed this concept. And Arlen worked on it for years before he retired. This is an awesome resource. It's hard to get a hold of this publication anymore. It's a bit dated, but it is available in PDF form from the Forest Service. And then another companion document is this field guide. It's called a crop tree field guide. It's a wonderful resource. It's actually tabbed by species. And there are about 16 to 18 species that are discussed in detail for their wildlife, timber, and other values. So it's a great resource to to look it up and if you do the Google search you can find those PDF files you can also get them through the Forest Service and then finally just kind of the Cliff Notes version of crop tree management if you want a quick introduction this fact sheet is another source for you okay so what is a crop tree crop tree is any tree that has the potential to produce a desired benefit for a landowner a wildlife crop tree is a tree that has that is capable of producing mast or cover for a desired wildlife species. So it's pretty common sense. Things that we're looking for in mass producing crop trees, we prefer trees that are up in that main canopy. Uh, that's important so that they're currently getting light and that they have enough crown to respond if we're going to do some management to try to release them. Um, I also probably should define what release is. Essentially, we're talking about giving a tree of interest or a tree that we're managing more space to grow. And we'll get into that in more detail as we go through the talk. We like those large, healthy crowns. We don't like a lot of dead branches up in the canopy just because large dead branches, um, of which we've got quite a few new ones in, in uh, southern Ohio after the big windstorm, but they can be a starting point for decay into a tree. Uh, which obviously can have an effect on the longevity of the tree. Those, those decay points can also be good for wildlife in that they produce cavities. We tend to prefer hard mass producers over soft mass pr producers because in most cases they are the limiting factor. Um, there are cases in, in, in situations where they're not, but in general hard mass producers are what we're going to favor. And most importantly is species variety. We'll talk more about this as we get into to it, but a variety of species is extremely important for wildlife management. And one good thing to think about, even if it's a species that you're interested in, it might have a healthy crown, some trees just don't produce masts. Um, and we don't really know why. Other trees are pretty consistent producers within the same species. And there are things like persimmon, which is a uh, actually has male and female trees. So I've had talked to woodland owners who've tried to uh, release persimmons and didn't get a response, and it was probably because they released male persimmon trees. So knowing a little bit about their history is important. It's also important to pick trees that have the potential to be around for a while. And with wildlife, unlike timber, we, we can accept some cavities and large broken branches just because of the other benefits of shelter that's provided. As far as those titles of those books, I'll be glad to list those later as we get to it or we can go back to it. Diversity is the key. Why is it important? Because mast is consumed by wildlife in all, all seasons. Our species of wildlife that evolved in, in the eastern part of the United States evolved in forest, and they are dependent on wildlife, and it's a year-round thing. Mass crops are cyclic. Certain species of trees, especially the oaks and the hickories, are very cyclic. 
Um, so some years you just have total failures of white oak acorns, for instance. So again, it's good to have that variety of species out there. Nutritional content varies by mass species as well. Um, if you think about your diet and how you need to get food and nutrition from a variety of sources, it's no different with wildlife. Having a variety of sources of food is important. Also, different species of wildlife favor different food sources. Some are almost totally dependent on certain, certain food sources. Others um, have a much wider diet, so it's important to, to have that variety for that reason as well. And then finally, um, in Ohio and the eastern part of the United States, we're dealing with a lot of non-native, especially diseases and insects. And uh, for instance, the emerald ash borer. Um, and so if you've got a species that you're almost totally dependent on, it, and then one of these non-native uh, invasive insects or disease uh, infests your forest, then um, it can have a devastating impact on your wildlife populations if you don't have species diversity. So what is crop tree management? It's a system that provides for a means of accomplishing single or multiple stewardship goals. It focuses on the release of individual trees to produce consistent to produce benefits consistent with uh, the landowner objectives. And it's based on a crown touching release. So we'll get into that discussion a bit as we go. I always like to use this analogy, the analogy of carrots. Um, I plant a garden every year. Most years, I try to plant carrots, and uh, it, it, it's, it never fails. Uh, if you look at the directions on the packet, it says to sow the seeds at about a half inch apart and a half inch deep. And I physically am not capable of doing that, so I tend to put too many seeds out there. And then on top of that, I've uh, got the extension job of traveling, working evenings, and I tend to not do a good job of weeding. So if you've got too many carrots out there, they're too closely spaced, and you've got weeds interspersed with them, then you tend to not um, have very good carrot crops. Uh, in fact, this year mine was a total failure. Uh, pretty, pretty typical for me with carrots. Trees aren't really any different. When it comes to trees, they need space as well. And what we'd like to see is trees that have an open crown that are getting, getting light from above and from the sides. Um, the, a concept that they talk about in the crop tree management book is a free to grow rating. And if you look at this diagram, the tree in the middle at the bullseye or the crosshairs is the crop tree that we're managing. And if you look at it, that tree has a decent sized crown, but it's not getting any light from the sides. It's only getting light from above, and therefore its free to grow rating is zero. It has no space to grow. And uh, those trees tend to grow rather slowly. The second example of a free to grow rating is a free to grow of two. And if you look in quadrants one and three, that tree has some space to grow. And in those quadrants, those trees are actually getting light um, from the sides a bit. And so the crowns tend to develop, they tend to have more surface area, they are deeper, and the tree can grow at a lot better rate and expand its crown to take advantage of that space. And then finally, a free to grow rating of four is a tree that's got room to grow on all sides. Just to look at the relationship between free-to-grow rating and growth rates, a, a free-to-grow rating, uh, on average, a tree that has a free-to-grow rating of zero. In, uh, basically, I think Arlen did this work in uh, Appalachian, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia. And uh, the trees that had a free-to-grow rating of zero averaged less than two inches in diameter growth over a 10-year period. But those that had a free-to-grow rating of four had an average diameter growth rate of four and a half inches over that same 10 year period. So essentially, by increasing the free to grow rating of these trees or giving them more room to grow, they're gonna grow at more than double the rate on average. Light's important for a lot of things. Vigorous dominant trees often produce more seed. They have sufficient energy reserves to reproduce. And there are exceptions. Some trees just before they die will prolifically seed as well, but that's short-lived. We're talking for the long haul. Trees that have larger canopies tend to have more energy reserves to produce seed and to fruit. Light also stimulates flower and fruit production. And vigorous, healthy trees have larger crowns. So the larger the crown, 
uh, not only means more energy reserves, but also means more surface area to produce um, those seeds and fruits. On the other hand, when competition is severe, trees are really crowded, there's barely enough food reserves to survive, uh, usually not enough light to stimulate flower production, and that does vary by species depending on how tolerant they are of shaded conditions. And then those small crowns have little surface area. This is, uh, I looked through the literature to find something, and this is a bit of a stretch. This is actually from apple production. But if you look at the left-hand column, that's the light intensity. The top uh, cell in there, let me grab my pointer here if I can get it to work. It doesn't seem to want to drag. Oh, well, the top left cell, that indicates 100% full sun versus the bottom left and the bottom of the column is uh, 11% full sun. And if you look at the corresponding numbers of flower buds on apples, you can see a big decrease in flower production on crowns that receive shade. And it's not going to be any different for most species of trees. Here's an example from my property. This is a little black oak tree. When I took this photo, that tree was about four inches in diameter. And if you look at that crown, it's a tiny little crown. In fact, a year or two later, that tree died just because it did not have enough light. That tree, my best estimate is that tree was about 50 years old and about four to five inches in diameter. On the same site, here's another tree. And I did, failed to mention, these are both black oak. This is about a 14 or 15 inch diameter black oak tree, which was pretty consistently producing acorns at the time I took the photo. The difference is just the amount of light that that tree received over the years as it was developing. Another example, the tree on the left is a hickory. Um, based on aerial photos and a little, little work, a little detective work I did on the property, this tree is probably about 50 years old. It's a small, overtopped shagbark hickory tree. It's not getting much sunlight at all, and I've never seen this tree produce uh, hickory nuts. The one on the right is actually quite a bit younger, much larger, healthier crown, and it's producing hickory nuts on a fairly frequent basis. Here's a neat example from my property, and I'm not sure if it was from a previous harvesting operation or actually just a tree that actually died on its own. But the tree right here is called is a service berry. And uh, if you look, that tree was in really rough shape at some point in time and almost dead. But for some reason, a gap formed in the canopy over in this part, and the tree produced a limb that grew into that gap, and this tree began to flower and fruit. So light is really the key for what is really important for uh, seed and fruit production. And then here's another example of a tree uh, that's not getting a lot of light. Looks like a pretty healthy crown. And just so I get some feedback, anybody want to tell me why that tree is probably not getting a lot of light? Anybody want to toss something into the chat box? Ah, I see Jerry's typing. Grapevines, good. Grapevines. Actually, there is a grapevine growing in that white oak tree. And if you look at that canopy, uh, the branches just seem to be really dense. And because of that dense branching, the grapevines will actually grow up over the canopy. Um, it's also important to realize that, that grapevines have some wildlife benefits as well. So we need to, we'll have that discussion a little later. And I'd also like to point out that grapevines are, need a lot of sunlight, so they're very aggressive. Other native vines, um, like poison ivy and Virginia creeper, uh, don't need so much sunlight. So they tend to not be as aggressive and not be quite as much of a problem for our crop trees. So how do we release a crop tree? Again, if you think back in your mind to those photos or, or those images of the tree crowns, what we'd like to shoot for is a higher fruit of growth rating than the trees are. Um, and this works really best when we're talking relatively young stands of trees. We probably wouldn't do crop tree management on large timber. We might mainly focus on smaller diameter trees, uh, sapling size, uh, or a small saw timber in size. So we're talking trees a couple inches up to maybe 
10 to 12 inches would be where it would make sense. That's DBH or diameter at breast height. But that would probably be where I would at least focus my crop tree release efforts. Um, and there are multiple ways that we can release those trees, but what we're trying to do is remove competing trees. Um, directional felling with a chainsaw is one of the things that comes to mind. You get a chainsaw, you cut down the competing tree. Uh, just a couple of pointers. I highly recommend marking those flag marking with paint or flagging those crop trees ahead of time and then use another color to flag the trees or paint the trees that need to be removed to give them space. Um, directional felling can be a bit of a challenge especially in small small uh, diameter trees um, where they're really crowded oftentimes you cut a tree and it just hangs and you have to cut it multiple times to get it on the ground so sometimes that can take more work than say girdling. And girdling, if you look at the example, you can do it basically this top row of uh, treatments here. There are multiple ways you can girdle. I tend to prefer using the middle way, a double girdle with a chainsaw. And I like to space those girdles or those cuts apart, say four inches or so. And essentially what you need to do is cut through the bark um, and just into the wood under the cambium so that you can uh, sever that tree's ability to trans transport nutrients up and down in the tree and to uh, to grow at that point. You don't want to girdle too deeply or these trees won't stand. You can also girdle and use herbicides, but I'd be extremely cautious with that because uh, herbicides can move through root systems. And unless it's a non-native tree that I'm trying to kill, like Alanthus, Tree of Heaven, or if you're in the south uh, or southern Ohio, even Polonia, or royal polonia, those trees I would probably take the extra effort and use an herbicide, but uh, you got to be careful with root grafting between uh, trees of the same species especially, and herbicides can move into those desirable crop trees, so you need to be real careful. And then the final um, depiction here is what we call a hack and squirt or a spaced injection method, and again, before you do any of this, I highly recommend uh, getting some help um, getting a prescription for the species you're trying to remove and kill. Um, I see Roger, or HW, I've got a Roger Weaver in Ohio, sorry, uh, basal bark applications. I typically wouldn't use basal bark applications just because there's more likely a chance that you can uh, get that herbicide into your crop trees. Um, so typically that's not what we would use unless we were focusing on non-native invasive plants. Here's an example from my property again. If you look at the tree on the right, that's a black walnut tree. The tree on the left that's got the double branching is a sugar maple tree. Um, the black walnut was actually had nice form to it, but when I looked up at the crown at that point in time, it was losing the battle. I don't have a lot of black walnut in my woods. Um, I actually manage for timber and wildlife and uh, obviously this sugar maple tree has some issues when it comes to timber value because of this low branching and this included bark. So what I did is went in with a chainsaw and did a double girdle. Um, went in probably about an inch deep all the way around. It's real critical that you make a connection and that girdle is complete and then I went down below it and did it again. From the photo, that's a little bit below where folks would normally do that. I'd normally do that wherever it's comfortable, but tends to be about waist high for me. But this tree had this low branching, and right down the seam is what we call included bark, or bark that is between those two branches or, or, or stems that grew together. So um, it's difficult to kill trees that have that included bark because they can still uh, transfer nutrients up and down in the tree. So that's why I girdled that tree low, thinking it may not be successful. But three or four years later, I went back and looked at the same trees, took a photo, and if you look, this is what we'd like to see happen. That bark dies and falls out between those two girdles, and the tree will die. You can actually see some fungi growing on, the, on that stem, so that's a pretty indication, good indication we had death. And then finally, and here's what I really like to, to show you, is if you look at the two stems that are dead, this tree died, top broke out of it even, 
And they tend to do that. They tend to not blow over, come down as a unit. They tend to fall over slowly, fall apart piece by piece. Um, in fact, in this heavy windstorm, even, we didn't have a lot of dead trees that went down. It's trees with foliage on that tend to go down. But the real thing I like to point out is this black walnut crown and how it's extended well beyond and above uh, this uh, maple crown. And this is probably after about four years after the release. Some key points on the crop tree release. Start on your most productive sites. Start on those sites where you can make a difference, where you have some species to choose from and work with. Releasing crop trees will increase the undergrowth. It will, you'll get a proliferation of growth under a crop tree release, especially if you're releasing large trees. Um, you allow light to the forest floor, you're going to get a response. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Well, that really depends on the woodland owner and their land owner objectives. If you're a deer hunter, you like to see some cover and some browse, it may be a good thing. It can also stimulate fruit production in some of those shrubs in the understory but it can also stimulate those non-native invasive plants. So it's important, it's really critical that we get those species under control before we disturb the canopy. Again, species diversity, I can't stress enough, is extremely critical. And remember that standing dead and downed trees have wildlife value. Amphibians tend to love downed Trees, um, standing dead trees are used heavily by things like woodpeckers and especially some of our winter resident birds. Be realistic, set your goals at a realistic level. Um, if you don't have crop trees, you can't release them. So you, you know, don't go out of your way trying to release trees that don't have the potential to meet your objectives. And remember, every tree that you release can make a difference. So even if you only release a couple trees per acre of that unique species that you, you only have a couple out there, it's worth releasing them and keeping them in the canopy because they can make a big difference for wildlife purposes. Other things you can do to enhance food production. One is just get a good inventory. Know what you've got out there. Hunters kind of have this in the back of their mind or at least they know in certain areas. But knowing the number, the diversity, and the productivity of your mass producers is, is the starting point. So having an idea. And actually knowing some of those individual trees, which ones have been heavy producers, which ones may have not been. Um, I noticed that we had a comment about uh, speaking away from the mic. Are most folks hearing me okay? Okay, it looks like most folks are doing good. I'm sorry, Don, I don't know how to help you. The mic is uh, on a headset, so I'm not changing my distance from the mic. Strive to maintain as many hard mass producers as practical. Grapevines. It's always good. I know, gosh, when I went to forestry school back in the 80s, a major thing we talked about for maximum timber production is removing grapevines. Well, um, it's really good to leave grapevines in the woods. They play a critical role for some wildlife species. For instance, squirrels use grapevines. Um, a lot of times those leafy summer nests are, uh, that squirrels make are in trees that have grapevines. And if you look at how those, grape, or those nests are made up, uh, they are largely made up of components from grapevines. Um, so I recommend maintaining those, a few of those grapevines per acre, but, on, but make sure that they're not on our potential crop trees because the crop trees can have negative consequences. If they're growing on trees that don't meet um, your goals, for instance, then uh, I would leave the grapevines there. Got a question from HW about run grapevines into deadened trees. I'm not sure. I understand that. Um, I, I guess what you're asking is, can grapevines move from live trees to dead trees? And that is possible, uh, but typically that's not an issue. Again, you don't. If you're in a stand heavy with grapevines, then you probably want to do some control. But if it's if you're uh, managing for a few per acre, that's usually not a problem. 
Another thing you can do is mow or cut approximately a fifth of your shrubby vegetation along woodland edges annually, or even if you've got old fields. Um, if you mow them with a brush hog or cut them back on a, on a rotation where you're only doing about a fifth a year, you'll have vegetation of different ages out there. You'll have one-year-old, two-year-old, and up to five-year-old vegetation. That's really critical for brambles. If you leave an open area too long, uh, the blackberries and raspberries will uh, eventually succession will take place and they will no longer be present so there's a really they won't produce fruit in the first year it takes at least two years uh, for a stem to produce and they'll occupy an area for a short time and then after that other species come in so setting that up on a rotation is important planting native mass producing trees and shrubs is also something you can do in, natural, in areas where you don't have good natural regeneration or say you've got an open field. In my instance, I've got a little bit of a wetland area that was uh, pretty much um, unoccupied by tree species. So I supplemented a planting in there, planted things like oaks, uh, swamp white, pin oak, and so on in there. So that's one way you can uh, enhance mass production. But realize you need to know the types of trees you're trying to reproduce and you want to make sure that you plant them on the right side sites and a lot of folks want to plant trees and shrubs in the forest and typically with a few exceptions they don't do too well in those shaded conditions so you want to plant them in open unoccupied areas and then last but not least is controlling those non-native invasive plants they can really take over an area decrease the diversity of native plants um, and yes in some cases they have mass that's consumed um, by wildlife but often it's not as nutritious as the native species and if they totally take over a site uh, that may be the only mass that's available so when that non-native plant like a bush honeysuckle or an autumn olive becomes dominant it prevents or it excludes other native plants and their mass production what I'd like to do for this point in time I normally have this portion worked into the presentation for earlier on in the presentation but I wasn't sure how it, how things would go as far as the flow and timing so what I did is reserve these last several slides to just introduce you to some of these mass producing species of trees that we're trying to manage for do we have any questions at this point before we move on I notice Jim is uh, typing a question so I'll we should have time for that and then we'll move on. And in the interest, I think we're just going to keep moving. Uh, an example of a hard mass producing tree are the red oaks. In, in Ohio, we've got probably the most common red oaks include shingle oak, northern red oak, black oak, scarlet oak. Those are probably the most common. We, we've got several actually more than that, but those are some of the more common ones. What's interesting about red oaks is that it takes two years for a red oak acorn to mature. You'll have flowering or you'll have a flowering and pollination in the spring and that tree will or that acorn will start to develop, but it won't fully develop in the first growing season. It actually overwinters and then matures the following growing season. So it takes two full years for a um, an acorn to mature on a red oak. Because of this, these uh, acorns are very bitter. They have lots of tannins and they tend to not be highest on the preference list of wildlife species. Um, those acorns actually do not germinate until the following spring. So it's essentially two years from the time you have pollination to germination. But they have a great long shelf life. And just like uh, kids, I've got three of them. When they're hungrier, they tend to eat things that don't taste as good. Um, so these things store well and are available later in the growing season or later in the winter months when food is very limited. Usually takes about 20 years for a red oak to produce acorns and that does vary by species. And uh, acorn crops are very cyclic, especially in the red oaks. Deer, turkey, rough grouse, black bear, lots of species use, obviously squirrels and other rodents, lot, lots of species use red oak acorns. When it comes to 
the other group, major group of, of oaks, it's white oaks. Uh, and some examples in Ohio are white oak, chestnut oak, bur oak, and swamp white oak. These acorns are a little bit different. They actually mature in one single growing season. You have pollination in the spring, the acorn matures that very fall, and it typically hits the ground in the fall and it starts to grow or germinate in the same growing season. Because of that, they're highly preferred. They don't have a lot of the tannins or the bitter uh, taste, but they're not very, uh, they're, they're a little bit more perishable because they germinate and start to grow right away. Fred's got a question, can a red oak produce mast every year or only every other year? They can produce every other or every year. Um, it's very cyclic. It depends on weather conditions, but it is not uncommon to have one and two year old acorns on the tree at the same time. So if conditions are right, they are capable of producing acorns every year. And again, about the same list of species that use them. Woodpeckers and lots of birds use them as well. American beech is one we don't think about a lot for wildlife. Um, those uh, fruit only take about a year to produce. They are hard mast. If you look at the photo, they're a little triangular nutlet. There are multiples that are produced in this little burr. And they do have good wildlife value. It does take a while for those trees to produce fruit. And they tend to be a little little bit cyclic just like the oaks as well. Ripen in the fall. If you're a squirrel hunter, you know this. This is probably the earliest hard mass mast that becomes available. All hickories are not the same. I list bitternut hickory up there, but it tends to be the least preferred of all the hickories. Uh, but they have a high fat content. They're extremely important for a lot of our, or for some of our overwintering species. But typically very few species can actually consume them. And if another hard mass species is walnut. It's actually an early producer, uh, a little bit earlier in the year. And it has good crops quite a bit more frequently than the oaks. Um, about every other year you'll have a decent uh, walnut crop. And they produce fruit when they're relatively young. So if you want early, quick, hard mast and you have open areas that are the right site for walnut, um, that is a great way to get some hard mast. But realize the list of uh, species that use them is pretty limited because of their hard nut. They're just extremely hard to crack and therefore many Wildlife species can't utilize them. Now we're into some soft mass species. Um, some examples are black cherry. Um, and we'll get through these relatively quickly. But a lot of songbirds and a lot of game species also use black cherry. Again, uh, those ripen in the summer. Wild grape we've already talked about. Peak fruit is usually in the in early or fruit fall is usually in early November. They actually ripen before then, but then they hit the ground in about November. And usually you have good um, grape crops in most years, and they can help to concentrate some of our game species. Where you have a big grape arbor, when the fruit hits the ground, uh, these game species will come in and actually eat the fruits. And if the actually fruit decays before it's uh, consumed, they actually come in and just eat the seeds. Some of the species that use them. Black gums, one that someone mentioned earlier, and I apologize, I can't remember who mentioned uh, trees that are high in fat. And uh, black gum is one of those that have a relatively high fat content, and it is a late uh, maturing fruit of a soft mass. Black gums tend to hollow out and make great den trees, and a lot of species use those. Um, I was in the woods last fall on a little workshop with some of my Forest Service uh, counterparts and it was amazing the birds that were coming in, uh, mostly towhees at that point in time that were using black gum. So black gum, even though it has very little timber value, can have some great wildlife value and it also the flowers are great for honey production. Even things that we don't think about, like yellow poplar or tulip tree is another name for it. They don't have a lot of nutritional value, but certain species use them. Finches will actually consume 
the seeds, uh, quail and finches and so on. And I've seen, as a growing up squirrel hunting in southern Indiana, I've seen squirrels early in the growing season actually feed, if I can get my pointer to work here, actually feed on these cones as they mature and right, when they're still green but before they open. Maples even, relatively low nutritional value, but I have seen squirrels and other animals consuming them. Sumacs, one we don't think of. These, this is actually smooth sumac. It's persistent food source well into the winter. It doesn't seem like many wildlife species are interested in it until we had snow cover for a while and uh, we get in the dead of winter and then all of a sudden they tend to disappear. The birds will come in and even deer will consume them. So can be very important during those winter months. Serviceberry is one of my favorites. It's also known as Juneberry. Um, we don't know a whole lot about it, but all I do know is that I, birds highly prefer them, and when they become ripe, they don't last very long at all. I've seen robins come into a serviceberry that I had planted in my yard, and uh, within days of when they ripen, they tend to disappear. There's lots of others. Um, I think that should give you a pretty good idea of the variety of species that are out there. Just to list some of them, American chestnuts one we're hoping makes a big comeback, but it was a major mass producer, especially in the mountains, the Appalachian Mountains, that was lost. And what, what makes it such a big loss is the fact that it flowers late in the in the spring so typically it flowers after those late frost hit and so it was a very consistent mass producer um, so it's one that's a, a major loss persimmons one that um, doesn't last long but when it's ripe if you're in an area where persimmon grows um, they are highly preferred and if you've got persimmon in there where you hunt uh, the deer will definitely use them heavily pawpaws really short-lived one as well Ohio Buckeye for those of you folks from Ohio um, even Brutus is mast. Um, fortunately, I don't know of any of the other Big Ten schools that consume mast, so, uh, as far as their mascots anyway, so that's a good thing. Sassafras, locust, and so on. I do want to point out poison ivy. If you look at the photo, trying to get my pointer again here, the photo here in the middle, those whitish berries are poison ivy. Um, and they are consumed by wildlife. I sat in a tree stand in the fall and saw quite a few winter birds feeding heavily on uh, poison ivy. So it's one of those food sources we don't always think about. A mast caught. Great. Vaxiniums are great, and I apologize for not mentioning them, the blueberries and so on. Uh, they're not very prevalent in the Midwest, as, not nearly as heavily as they are, say, in the uh, northeastern part of the country. And even dogwoods have great fruit production. Plum is one that I've got all over my property. Um, it's just a prolific fruiter in most years. Um, blackberries and raspberries are important, and you can get them relatively quickly. Actually, I do have a blueberry listed up there. And then finally, viburnums. A little bit concerned about our ver viburnums. I'm going to try to go back to that slide. Because uh, we have viburnum leaf beetle in Ohio, and we're a bit concerned that it may have a impact on some of our native viburnums and we have quite a diversity of native viburnums in the eastern part of the United States. So finally, I know that was a lot of information, um, but finally when it comes to enhancing food production for wildlife, um, the most important thing I recommend for woodland owners is to get help. Get Consult with a professional, get specific informations about, information about your woodlots. You may have a species out there you're not aware of that could play a major role. Um, you could also make mistakes and actually remove some of your mass producers when you're trying to release something else. So I highly recommend working with your state divisions of forestry, uh, consulting foresters, private lands biologists with your divisions of wildlife, and then also your cooperative extension folks. Um, we tend to not, um, the folks in Ohio anyway, uh, there are so few of us, we tend to not be able to make a lot of field visits, but we're certainly here to provide educational programs and uh, help you through the process. 
with that, um, I'd be glad to take questions. So if anybody has questions, um, I'm open. I see Pete also popped up the exit survey. So we don't, before you leave, we want to make sure you complete the exit survey. I certainly can, Pete. Yeah, Dave, can you hear me? Okay, good. I my connection blanked out there in the middle, and I wasn't sure if I needed to reset up my audio. But this was a great job, Dave. Um, and you have uh, some questions there. If you want, you can start um, scrolling backwards. And and as Dave pointed out, there is an exit survey. We'd like everybody just to click on that link or copy and paste it into your web browser to make sure that uh, we get a chance to get your feedback. It's it's uh, it's important to it's important to uh, to do that so we can get feedback for the speakers as well as for the tech. I really am not. For, I've heard of it, so but I really I saw a can't question comment from on it because I'm not PJ familiar with about Sorry. American Beauty. If you want to, my email is at the not, beginning I'm of the presentation. American Beauty um, if you would like to, in fact, I'll type it in the chat box here. And if anybody would like to email me and have specific questions like that, I would be glad to respond on an individual basis and look that up for them. And there's my email address. Jim Wilkins had asked. Jim Wilkins asked a question about um, a, a good publication to give recommendations on crop trees for grouse and deer. Are yeah, that would be great. Um, turkey and then also, guide, I, and then are, the, are the Wild guide Turkey Federation folks on board? I would guess, and the Rough Grouse like Society would probably have other recommendations. Um, but um, and when it comes to grouse and deer, I think they, it would vary. Uh, we've mentioned a lot of the deer species. With grouse, I think the major limiting factor is more the type of cover and having some of that real early heavy cover is probably plays the biggest role in getting grouse populations back. It's real critical to have a bit of that mixed into the landscape, yes. So Other brushy questions. seedling sap. I've uh, got a size Christian class question about heavy fern cover. Fortunately, that's not a problem we typically have in Ohio, so there's probably other folks out there like Pete. If you want to weigh in on that one, that'd be great. Um, so the, the 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 best way to control ferns is with. Uh, well, you, there's, there's some people that um, suggest you can do it with mechanical mowing, and the research on that has shown that it's, uh, I'll say, minimally effective. I think there's about a 40% reduction if you would go in and mow your, you can get fern fields, particularly where there's heavy over-browsing by deer, and uh, some mechanical treatments will reduce fern cover by as much as 40%. But typically, you're going to have to use some kind of a, of a foliar uh, chemical treatment, a glyphosate-based, like a Roundup treatment. Um, and all I'm, of the, I'm, this all probably of not the pesticides fair, but I'm going to do last in, first out, I guess. And and that is, uh, Heather's got uh, a question about repeating mowing required. No, it's not required. But what will happen over time is succession will take place, and those shrubby plants will tend to go away, especially things like blackberries and raspberries. Uh, other plants will dominate and shade them out, so they won't be there for long. Rich Kappel's got a question about goose. Go ahead, sorry. Oh, she, Heather, oh maybe. I'm sorry. Gotcha. Yeah. And ferns, uh, deer play a big role in that. And unfortunately, our deer densities probably ferns. aren't quite as yep, high as what they've historically been yep. in, in the eastern part of the United States. So That's okay. I think right. fur and preferential browsing has probably played a big role in that as well. As far as Rich Kappel's question, is gooseberry, I think it's a question, is gooseberry common in Ohio? And it's not a real common one, but it is one we see out there occasionally. Got a question from H.W. Weaver about monies available for wildlife enhancements. Uh, typically, that there is some money that can come down through federal funding sources, 
and that typically would go into your state agencies in Ohio. There, there is equip money or in whip money out there. They call it whip, and those funds are available. You really need to make contact with your local folks in your local natural resource conservation service office or with your local foresters, your state forester, or actually your wildlife state wildlife agencies as well can because uh, every state has different emphasis and priority so it, it may vary but I know in Ohio historically we've had some funds available for crop tree release for wildlife and timber other questions you can help me pick out of there Pete that we haven't talked about okay Um, so Phil had one about using glyphosate around beach. You probably had a little more experience, but I, I think I know your um, answer to that one. Go ahead. In there. I'm not sure if that's a typo. Um, so I can respond to that, or you can respond to that, Dave. So the, so glyphosate can be applied in um, about three different uh, modes of application. Um, and, and before I do that, I'll just encourage people, if you scroll back in the chat pod, you'll see a link to uh, cornellforestconnect.ning.com. We had Dave Jackson from Penn State Cooperative Extension in February give a webinar on forest herbicide uh, treatments, and that's a, that's a great uh, resource. But in terms of specifically with beach, you can control beach using a foliar treatment of uh, small stems less than... Uh, usually less than about an inch in diameter you can spray into the into the beach canopy you can do a hack and squirt on beach or you can do a cut stump control on beach uh, the work that I've done with the with the cut stump on beach using glyphosate which is the active ingredient roundup there's been no movement from beach into other species and we looked at red maple sugar maple oaks um, ash cherry so the, the glyphosate moves well within the beach root okay. system. It kills the suckers if you're doing a cut stump treatment, but there is no transfer into the uh, uh, non-beach species. Picked out a question. So maybe, uh, Phil, if that oh, didn't answer your question, uh, you can type in another question. Uh, Bob, I encourage Bob Nealon asked that. the question about sassafras. I'm kind of intrigued by that because so I've done some question. work with, uh, with deer browsing in Ohio. <laughs> We've got several deer exclosures where we're looking at what deer prefer and actually here sassafras sprouts are highly preferred in the winter months they stay green and they tend to browse them so I was kinda of curious if Bob's question was relating to the actual browsing or if it was to the fruit production but uh, as far as browse for deer in Ohio uh, the deer seem to preferentially browse it and they like it looks like Bob's responding to that so we give him a second. Pete, while we're waiting on that, are, do you see any other ones we've missed in there? Hello? I think we may have lost Pete. some dead silence out there so if folks that are still on board would actually type in and let me know you're still there I'm willing to hang on as long as we've got a quest you've got questions coming in I can hang on a bit longer and ask answer questions still here Pete's there I just didn't hear his voice anymore good um, Pete do you see any other questions we've missed Okay, there you are. Hi, Dave. I'm back. Sorry, my connection comes and goes. Yeah. Um, so I, so I, I may have missed some of your responses. My, my system shut down. I had to restart it. Um, Herb has 
Herb Lindman asked a question about uh, red I oak acorns and frost damage. I honestly damage. don't know don't that for a that. fact, but I don't think they're very vulnerable at all to frost damage once they get through that first growing season. It's it's mainly that critical period when you have flowering uh, going on and pollination going on, and, and those flowers are most susceptible. Other questions? I see... Uh, and then um, uh, CLG asked if there's wildlife value or preference for musclewood. I don't uh, know the or... answer to that. My guess is um, the, the seed is not probably highly nutritious or highly preferred, but it's going to be a dried seed that stores pretty well. So I would not be surprised at all if a lot of our overwintering songbirds would utilize them. I could do a little homework on that to see that for sure. Um, but it's obviously probably not one that you want to be the dominant and only species in your understory, but having a few could definitely be a supplemental food source. Then uh, did you see Jim Wilkins has a question about a landowner that wants beech cut to encourage sprouting for grouse. Any to to what extent do grouse use beech thickets? Getting a little bit out of my league there, but my guess is they would have to be relatively large nope. openings to be useful. And I don't think it really matters so much as the species, but more how dense those stands are. So as long as you can create large enough openings to get that proliferation of thick brush that they can utilize, um, it very well could be successful. But doing a few beech in the understory scattered wouldn't do it. That's uh, uh, Jim. That might be a good question to to reach out to the Rough Grouse Society and see what their recommendations are. It's, I mean, as, as Jim certainly well knows, the the, the concern there is you get a transition right. from a diverse forest to a non-diverse forest that's going to be dominated by beech, and then and then a yeah. very expensive forest to yeah. try to convert back to something that's. It's, uh, yeah, and it's, it's definitely different in the Northeast. Uh, we rarely have stands totally dominated by beech, and as you as you go south and west of where you folks are. Other questions I've me missed in there, Pete. Um, I see a looking. question about wineberry, preferred food or pest, and I I depends who you talk to is what's the answer. That's a non-native. Uh, berry, and I'm drawing a total blank on the species name of that, but it, there is a non-native uh, bramble that we don't commonly find in Ohio, but there are a few places where it's there. It's called wineberry, and it is highly preferred, but it can also be a quite a bit of a pest and take over. So it's one of those ones I tend to really highly favor the native plants, and uh, I would prefer to have the native blackberries and raspberries over the wineberry, which is not native. I I support that logic completely. So, um, so PJ wants to know if he can link up the resources mentioned in the National Wild Turkey Federation website. That's certainly fine with me, and yes. uh, I'm assuming fine with Dave. There's uh, let me put. I'm typing in a link. This is a social network site that I manage. It's a Ning site, so it's kind of like Facebook, only it's better, cornellforestconnect.ning.com. And uh, when, when we get done here, I'll, I can recover, immediately recover the recording and archive it and post it into a blog at that Forest Connect Ning site, so that's instantly available for people who want to be able to, to come in and watch the recording of this. So that's and that's also a place where where the people that that um, belong to that Ning site, which is easy to belong to, you just register your your name and email address. There's no cost, then you can post resources there as well. So if if um, you know PJ, if you wanted to go there and link to this archive, we can load Dave's uh, resource files in there, and then you can also post some of the National Wild Turkey Federation resources there. So it's a it's a great place to interact, and that's why I like the Ning site so much better than something like um, 
Facebook, which Facebook, I think, seems to be used for other kinds of, of interests. So we keep the Ning site clean and focused on natural okay. resources. Well, if there are uh, no, no other questions, Dave, thanks very much. This was a great presentation. I apologize. My connection was dropping in and out, but I think you stayed connected the whole way through and, and uh, gave a great presentation. Uh, I appreciate the, the audience and the presenter. And Dave, we'll be, you and I at least, will be back here again okay, tonight. Thanks, Pete, for the opportunity. And thanks for the audience. For looks like we still have a few hanging on at the end. So uh, I enjoyed it and uh, look forward to interacting with you in the future. Welcome. Great. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Dave. See you in a few hours.